Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to advance in leadership, then this podcast is for you. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker, and Monique Marquez, senior corporate leader, ex-Googler, and diversity expert. From inspiring stories to cutting edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Nikki Barua, your host for today's episode. Have you ever proceeded down a career path even though you didn't feel it was right for you? Perhaps it was due to family expectations to go into a certain profession or the pressure to stick with it because you've already invested so much time. Expectations of who we're supposed to be or what we're supposed to do can often lead us down the wrong path. But regardless of the reasons, one thing is certain. Your success gets accelerated when you are aligned to your purpose and passion. Meet Elizabeth Verges, Global Leader for Talent and HR Transformation Strategy at IBM. Elizabeth shares her story of gaining perspective from her failures while heading down the wrong career path and how those failures helped her find her true purpose, define the ways in which she wanted to contribute to the world, and set her on the path to being the author of her own story. Elizabeth is a business leader and board director who partners with C-level leaders to enable powerful business outcomes. Elizabeth furthers people and technology strategies with solutions in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, blockchain, and robotics for organizations that operate around the world and in space. She's recognized as a global top 100 influencer for her continuing work as a futurist and thought leader. Elizabeth brings creativity and a thoughtful collaborative approach to inspire and to uncover the best thinking and exceed business results. In this episode, Elizabeth shares insights into taking risks to advance your career, thriving in the future of work, and the most valuable skill for success in the digital age. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. So great to have you on the show. We're thrilled to have you as our guest today because our show is all about empowering women uh, to advance in leadership. And you have this incredible success story and a track record of so many accomplishments. So I can't wait to share with our audience um, all of your journey and lessons learned throughout. So welcome. Thank you, Nikki. It's wonderful to uh, see you and connect. And uh, thank you for including me. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. Um, let's start with your formation story. Tell us uh, a little bit about your, uh, you know, where you grew up and, you know, those early days and whether you knew what you wanted to be. Sure, sure. So, you know, so I grew up in Bombay. I still call it Bombay <laughs> or Mumbai, India, as it's called. Um, and I was the middle child of three girls. And I and I say this because, you know, I grew up in a fairly patriarchal, conservative environment. Um, and uh, my parents were both scientists. They worked for a BARC, which is kind of like a Los Alamos of India. And, uh, you know, the, the one thing that they really taught me was the importance of working hard, doing your best work every day and really paying it forward. Because I think when you grow up in a large metropolis like um, like Bombay, there's so much disparity around mm -hmm. you. You, uh, you have to become conscious of your privilege or luck or, you know, just the fact that you have a chance to gain an education. Um, and that thread of really giving back and paying it forward, I think, defined a lot of my experiences as a child and also, I think, defined who I am as a, as a professional. Um, so, you know, my, my mother is a nuclear chemist. I'm very wow. proud of her. Uh, back in the 60s, she was one of the few women in India to do pioneering work, setting up some public-private partnerships. She was a great role model. She raised, you know, three girls while doing her PhD. Wow. Um, and I think that work ethic, which, you know, it was not easy. It was not easy um, to just keep forging forward, focusing, paying it back, um, and then really kind of engaging and helping the community. I think our lessons I saw um, and, and seeing all the time that it's not easy to do those things. Mm -hmm. um, but still wanting to do them because they're the right, right thing to do. So I, I think those are the things that kind of define me a lot. So you had your mom as a role model who showed what it meant to, you know, pursue your vision and your ambition and also raise a family and what it takes in terms of the work ethic, the sacrifices and the focus to be able to do that. Absolutely. And, and I think in addition to that, also that responsibility to 
to work mm. because you know other people have done things for you we all stand mm. on their shoulders right? right so you really want to make sure you are enabling that platform for other people going forward so yeah. um, i think that and that it's a good message to kind of hold on to as you as as i've traversed through professional mm. life both in india and the us so that's wonderful about your, you know, uh, learning from your mom and having a role model right at home. You know, how did that uh, early upbringing then kind of shape your perspective on what you wanted to be when you grew up uh, and, you know, your academic choices? You've got tremendous, uh, you know, uh, impressive education. Tell us a little bit about that. So that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I think some of my academic choices were actually defined by failure. Um, and mm-hmm. I'll explain why. In the sense that, you know, I was a good student, and um, but I had always expected to become a doctor. Mm. And because, you know, that's that's what good girls in India do. Yes. Um, and I actually did not have the, the marks to make it into medicine. So that was, you know, pretty significant setback early on in my life because I had a mission, I had a purpose, I was working towards. And um, I think like everything else, it taught me that sometimes the path you think you should be on or you plan for is not necessarily the right path and you mm-hmm. can do much more in another, you know, in another direction. <laughs> so um, when I did my master's from Tata Institute, which is uh, an, you know, an institute in Mumbai, Bombay, um, the education that was in through the management uh, degree that we got was very much purpose driven, very much socially um, mm. driven. And I think some of those lessons I learned in that new path that I took um, after really overcoming, you know, as, as a teenager, you when you don't get what you expect to get or learn from, it makes you reflect on how do you then navigate, right, what next? Mm-hmm. So I think in hindsight, you know, those failures were actually really good for me because yeah. they made me seek more purpose and find how I really wanted to contribute in different ways, not the ways I expected to, but, you know, in ways maybe, you know, uh, were more meaningful and useful to everybody else. Yeah, that's so so true, because no matter what failure leads you to, you can always find success in that new path if you have an open mind and continue to learn and grow in that. Um, So, you know, given the career choices or the academic choices um, that you made since then, how did your career then unfold, um, you know, throughout the various corporate roles you've held and rising up within the corporations? Sure. So, you know, as I, as I always think about, like when you craft a path, you make a plan, you make a list, and then you have to be ready to throw it away <laughs> and start afresh or take a different direction. So instead of following a career in science, I, you know, ended up uh, taking up a career in corporate life in the human resources, which was chosen for a reason, because I thought mm-hmm. that was a way to, you know, add meaning and value and purpose to uh, to corporate life because I was also observing that corporates were becoming um, powerful entities and, you know, growing up in India, the role of the government is very significant, mm-hmm. but that was slowly shifting as liberalization um, mm-hmm. was, uh, you know, uh, and being uncovered. And I did realize early on that corporates have a responsibility, they have the ability to really integrate across national boundaries and, you know, mm-hmm. drive change in ways that maybe, you know, regional local governments could not. So to that extent, the you know, fact of choosing HR as the area I specialized in was purposeful and kind of aligned to what I was observing in the market. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, I moved to the the United States as an impatriate um, in the late 90s. My company moved me here. Um, I, you know, came here with very little um, and with lots of um, assumptions around or met lots of assumptions around, you know, who I was or who I was supposed Mm -hmm. to be and what I was supposed to do, much like growing up in India, you know, as a woman in India, you are expected to do certain things and you choose to, or you do not, um, depending on your internal compass. So I think, um, you know, through my life in, um, in corporate India and corporate America, um, I did learn that it was really, really important to be the author of your own potential of your own capability Mm. and to be the single author in the sense that, you know, you, take lots of advice, you talk to lots of people, but, you know, you define what you're capable of. Mm -hmm. Um, You need to author what you think you're you, you want to do and you know, how you're going to do it. And I mm-hmm. think that lesson is something that is really, you know, important. Um, even as I, you know, as I talk to my, my daughters, right. Um, it's really important to think about um, who you are, what you want to be and, and, and not be, I mean, be influenced, but, you know, um, 
choose, make the choice yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a powerful statement to be the author uh, of your own story. And um, I am curious, you alluded to the idea of, uh, you know, being lucky and, and having the good fortune of opportunity. Um, you know, why is that? I mean, what shaped you in recognizing your, uh, you know, ability to have opportunities that perhaps other women in India at the time did not have access to? Um, so that's a, that's a really good question. That's a big question, Nikki, yeah. right? So, um, and I think well, were there some pivotal stories or, you know, incidents that sort of made you aware of that? And I asked that because so often we don't fully recognize, even in our own set of challenges, that there's much to be grateful for uh, until you recognize someone else that doesn't have what you already have. Absolutely. You're so right. You're so right. And, you're, and I said it was a big question because I think there's two intersections to it. I think one is the aspect of, you know, candidly, family values. And, mm -hmm. you know, my parents were very conscious of um, what was around them. And they did, you know, infuse that to us in many different ways, that sense of responsibility mm -hmm. um, that, you know, whatever you have, um, it's a lot, right? Mm -hmm. so it may not be a lot, but it is yeah. a lot. It's enough and you can give, you can share. So I think there is that part of it. Um, I think the second part of it is, you know, um, being awake and being aware of what's around you. And I think that always creates gratitude, no matter where you are, whether you're in India or in, you know, in New York City, right behind me. If you're aware to what's around you, you know, you will see that you have enough and you mm -hmm. have something to give. Um, and I think from my perspective, when I was, you know, growing up in Mumbai in India, um, I encountered, you know, several issues of where lack of access to opportunities um, made a big difference in not just your life, but in the life of multiple generations. Mm. So the impact of those disparities are multi-generational. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I was, um, and I write about this in in, in the book I'm uh, that's coming out in April. Uh, I had a classmate in middle school who, you know, who got married when she was 15. And part of the reason, you know, she chose it and it was chosen for her was because of that access to education or mm. the access to feeling that even if you don't have a great, you know, set of grades, you have other opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So it made very clear to me early on that um, if you have opportunity of any kind, you are privileged. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are many people who don't have those opportunities. And if we can find a way to, you know, link arms and make sure more people have access to what they need, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, so how much better would we be as a, as a community, as a global community? Uh, absolutely. And in that um, access to opportunity, sometimes not even being aware that that is possible often shapes the perspective and the worldview you have and the choices you end up with. And um, you and I have a lot of similar uh, experiences, you know, having grown up in India and coming uh, to the United States at roughly about the same timeline we're fortunate, you know, like the life we've been able to create the opportunities we've had. Um, but take us back to those early days when you were first, uh, you know, out here. What kind of limiting beliefs or fears that you experience? You know, what was that like? Because that's a dramatic shift. I was very cognizant of what I, you know, the privilege that I did come in with, yeah. like I had, you know, I, I wasn't coming in with uh, nothing. I mean, but I was starting afresh, completely, you know, reinventing myself. And I think some of the challenges uh, were practical and some of them were, you know, mental, both mine and others. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember this, you know, uh, funny episode. It's very funny now, but it was terrifying at that moment. Um, I had just landed in Southern California and I was trying to set up my phone connection and I was on the line with, um, somebody from uh, Southern Bell, I believe that was the uh, company that had the, the landlines. And the lady at the end of the line could not follow me um, because I had an accent. And honestly, I couldn't follow her because she had a heavy Southern accent. And, you know, I'm coming in assuming that I speak English, I write it well. Um, and I had this terrifying moment when I realized that I was incomprehensible um, to somebody. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny now. Um, but at that moment, you know, I, I remember thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? Like, <laughs> lady can't even understand what I'm saying. 
<laughs> um, now, you know, over the years, I, you know, I've, I've learned how to manage that, how to listen better, how to speak more slowly, right? Things I've had to do to make that shift uh, and accept that. Um, and, you know, I, I remember another incident when I was traveling on work and I had no credit card because uh, I didn't have credit history. So my company had booked me into a hotel, um, you know, and kind of I think they guaranteed the you know payment or something like that. And I show up there late at night and um, they basically wouldn't give me a room because I didn't have a credit card. Um, so, you know, I'm this, I'm a woman in, in, in the city in, in the middle of the night and thinking, what am I going to do? Where am I going to stay? <laughs> I, uh, so I think some of those practical challenges of starting afresh, um, you know, definitely taught me about um, realizing that it, it takes a lot to build a life. It takes mm-hmm. a lot for you know, people who come with a lot less than I have to build a life, right? So if you kind of reflect on some of the challenges that I think all of us face in our daily life, it, I think, always will remind you, yes, I had that challenge, Mm -hmm. but, you know, I also had the privilege to be able to call somebody Mm -hmm. and have them put their credit card in and, you know, get a hotel room that night instead of sleeping on the park bench. Yeah. So, um, and so those are, you know, just a couple of things uh, I, I experienced and, um, I think from a, you know, from a mental construct or um, framework perspective, um, you know, I I think there are lots of cultural nuances when you start afresh, the way you write. Mm -hmm. Um, Something as simple as um, lots of people who write in colonial English, write Mm -hmm. in the passive voice and corporate America writes in the active voice. You start with a verb Um, and, you know, even small things like not knowing to do that make a big impact in your perceived competence or your perceived success. Um, And I do remember this because it was the kindness of a friend who gave me a very simple tip. She said, Elizabeth, write your sentences in active voice um, and, you know, start with the verb on every bullet. It was a very simple thing and it made a huge difference. And I'm, you know, I always remember that lesson from my friend Erin, who if she ever listens to this, you know, will know. But I think those kinds of practical things, um, which you you don't know what you don't know, you don't know what's valued in different cultural construct, Mm -hmm. are things I think, again, you know, remind you to be more empathetic when Mm -hmm. you encounter people who are everyone's coming from a different place. They're all coming from different, they all have different pieces of information to navigate. So I think if we can all reflect upon the things we didn't know, I think it makes you a much better, um, uh, a better coworker, a better collaborator, right? Because you understand their journeys too. That yeah, I can relate to everything you're sharing, including the passive to active voice, because I had to go through the same thing myself. And much like you, there was a very kind friend who helped me realize how to you know communicate uh, in I guess the American colloquial uh, voice. And uh, but it really highlights uh, so much of what it takes in terms of you know, stepping into uncertainty and newness, much like what we've experienced over the past year with COVID, you know, when the future is uncertain (laughs) and you don't have the traditional things that you rely on, you know, for uh, your guardrails are no longer existent. You have to rely on conviction within yourself and ask for help and give yourself grace as you learn and adapt through that. Um, so, so much of our immigrant journeys are so much of the same kind. Uh, I think it also helps you take more risks in that, um, you know, as you look forward. So what are, you know, as you look at like how some of those experiences shaped you, um, tell us about sort of, you know, the mindset of stepping into bigger opportunity, taking risks to advance in your career, and what guidance would you give to our listeners to, you know, um, to recognize that is a necessary part of success and advancement? So, you know, a couple of things. I I think that when we um, are navigating in corporate life or, you know, academic life, you know, in in our professional careers, we're always at the receiving end of so much input, especially nowadays, right? There's information, there's best practices, there's papers, there's opinions about who you are and what you should be doing. Um, And I think what's really important, you know, there are three things. One is you have to look inward. You have to reflect inward. Um, the second is you have to be honest about what you need. Now I'll talk about this a little bit. Um, and I think the third part of it is, you know, you have to be the author. Mm. Um, 
so when you think about the first aspect of looking inward, you know, you have to constantly reflect on what you're learning and your experiences. You know, you're not going to wake up one day, you know, spend 10 minutes with your journal and then know, right? It's that epiphany is, you know, it may happen, but it's a constant journey because that answer keeps changing on a day-to-day basis, mm-hmm. right? You might have it all figured out and then COVID hits and then all your assumptions go away. Mm-hmm. So I think that aspect of looking inward is really important and being honest with yourself. I um, mean, you know, I know I'm not going to be, you know, a quantum scientist. I don't have that capability, right? Mm-hmm. So I think you also have to be honest about, okay, what is it that you can do well and you want to do well? What are your motivations? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, are you here for a paycheck? Are you trying to, you know, drive meaning into work? Are you trying to, you know, define the future of work, right? Which is part of what, I mean, how, how are you going to be using your voice for mm-hmm. your mission and be very, very honest and intentional about it? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the third part of it is, you know, just uh, as I mentioned before, you know, being that single author of your of your destiny, of your choices, of defining your capability. Um, you know, I think growing up in India in a very conservative environment, a lot of what I experienced was, you know, expectations of what you're expected to do, right? Mm. Um, So I think what I've learned and learned to be is very conscious about the choices you're making. Are you making them because you want them or are they expected of you? Mm. And how do they tie into, you know, your inner North Star? How do they tie into who you are as a person and who you want to be as a person? Um, And and those are, you know, messages I tell my girls every day. I have a 16-year-old and a 12-year-old who are navigating to be teens in this world of social media. Um, So it's very important to, you know, keep close to your purpose um, Mm -hmm. because um, there'll be many days when you doubt yourself and other people will doubt you. But if you know who you are and what you're here for and what you want to leave with, uh, it, it does make a big difference. That's powerfully put. Thank you for sharing that. What if you could pinpoint the invisible ceilings limiting your success? Imagine having clarity on your strengths and barriers so you can take action and gain unstoppable momentum to advance as a future ready leader. Well, that's exactly what the Beyond Barriers quiz will help you discover. You'll get your personalized score based on the 25 essential elements proven to accelerate success in the digital age, so you can understand what's holding you back and where to focus your efforts. The Beyond Barriers quiz is completely free and takes just a few minutes. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com slash quiz and take the quiz today. You're someone who's at the forefront of, you know, defining things for the future of work and, uh, you know, really looking at how it impacts people and talent and culture. Give us um, sort of a 30,000 foot view of, you know, um, (laughs) as an expert and a thought leader in that space, um, give us some guidance around what people should be thinking about, you know, as they're looking at their careers in the context of future of work and what, how to thrive and how to be effective uh, in that, what skill set, what mindset is necessary to be effective in that? So there are, you know, three big forces really at play right now. Um, So one is the, the force of technology, right? Technology if you can imagine it, technology can make it happen. Mm-hmm. So that's one, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the second aspect of it is people and humanity at the center of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll, you know, so the, the human intention, the human purpose, the human skill set has to be at the core. And I mentioned technology first because it's actually not as important as the person and the human at the second part of it. Um, and I think the third big force that you know we're working on and observing is. Um, actually, the aspect of space exploration and mm. um, that those three forces are really going to transform a lot of the work that we'll be doing in the future of work. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of go back to the number two, which is, you know, the person at the heart of it. Right. So as you think about these two forces, the side, there's technology, there's, you know, space exploration. And I use space exploration as an analogy to really describe all the potential, all the possibilities that are out there. So technology is going to enable that Mm -hmm. with the human at the heart of it. So Mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, 
uh, how an individual needs to navigate through these forces, through these disruptions, is going to be our North Star in the future of work. When I say our, the, you know, the big R as, as, a, as a global community. Um, and we are finding that as individuals are, you know, navigating through the world of work that's changing, the skills and capabilities that they're bringing to the table are going to be the central definition of who they are. Um, and by the use of technology like blockchain and AI, we're going to be, you know, democratizing access to skills, democratizing access to opportunities, um, ensuring that people, you know, whether they're in India, where I grew up, right, or um, Africa or in rural communities anywhere in the world are able to access those same kinds of opportunities and skills and capabilities through the power of technology, through the platforms of AI and blockchain, which will provide provenance and information and authentication of data. So you're not constrained by your location or mm -hmm. the fact that you didn't go to college or you didn't go to Harvard. Those things are going to be less important um, than the fact that you're bringing skills and capabilities to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you think about you know, where we are with space exploration, um, the, the fact that every company, you know, much like the internet in the old days, right, every company has become, a, you know, has an internet component. Mm -hmm. Similarly, every company will have a space component. Um, and this is a little further out there than I think um, we've been having in our public discourse around corporate life. But some of those implications around, you know, and things we would learn from collaborating in virtual environments, collaborating in, um, you know, in, in space are very, uh, going to be very material and germane to how we collaborate virtually mm -hmm. uh, because the world is going to become more virtual and your geography location is already becoming you know fairly irrelevant as we've seen through COVID. Yeah. That is fantastic because you painted a picture of the future, especially as someone who is that futurist. You're helping our audience understand, you know, what context should they use in looking at the future and how do they place themselves to ride that wave as opposed to being disrupted by it, right? So um, let's take it one step further now to say, okay, with so much change, the magnitude of change and the pace of change is significant. How do I as an individual develop my skills or competencies when everything around me is changing so fast that I can't keep up? What do you think is the most valuable skill for anyone to develop in this context? That's a really good question. Um, so I think the most valuable skill or capability or muscle we can all develop is actually one of unlearning. Mm. Um, and, you know, and I you see, you know, purposely saying, I'm not saying learning, it's about unlearning because yeah. the pace of change is going to be so rapid. Um, and sometimes I tell people, you know, savor this second you're in because this is going to be the slowest you know life is going to be every moment after this is faster right? right so that pace of acceleration in you know in life and business disruption is so rapid the skills and capabilities you need are going to constantly evolve so mm -hmm. for that reason your ability to unlearn and accept new input accept new requirements is actually going to be your most important um, you know um, life skill, really. Um, you know, we're finding uh, in the work that I've been doing, um, you know, over the past five years, many of the skills and capabilities that are deemed critical today, like take blockchain, for example, over a third of those were completely, you know, unknown about five to six years ago. You couldn't take a class on blockchain. But, you know, we're finding that's becoming very important. And, uh, you know, for people like me, I have a middle schooler, as I mentioned, when she reaches, uh, you know, finishes college, over 65% of the jobs jobs that she'll be looking to, you know, um, probably uh, take up don't exist today. They're going to be completely new and created. So that ability to kind of let go of your old constructs or paradigms about, you know, what I should do, how I should do it, uh, and accept new ideas is going to be the, the key to survival and thriving. Survival and um, build a more inclusive world, not just a more innovative world, because if we can shed our biases and our prejudice and our preconceived notions, not just to learn new skills, but also to accept people that have different perspectives, I think it would certainly build a kinder uh, world around us. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as 
uh, you are in, you know, very uh, senior um, HR uh, and talent development roles. And, you know, as you think about preparing that talent um, for, you know, the future, and specifically you look at women in the workplace, share some, um, you know, insight into what you found more from a research and data perspective of some of the barriers um, that, you know, hold women back and, you know, specifically what advice would you give to our audience in overcoming those barriers? So I think the reality for women is that, um, you know, it's not easy, right? Um, And this is true for, you know, other marginalized groups as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, um, Adulting is not easy, right? And being a woman in the corporate life, corporate world is not easy. So I think the first thing is to kind of acknowledge that, right? And, um, you know, early on in my career, and even sometimes today, I have moments of disappointment when people don't do the right thing, Mm -hmm. or they, you know, they don't do what I hope they would do or expect they do. But, you know, that's reality. You have to be very pragmatic about the the world you're navigating in because I think what that does is it kind of takes away that that emotion out of it, right? It makes mm-hmm. it very factual. Um, so I think that's the first part of it. Um, I think the second part of it is, um, you know, doing that, going with your gut. So um, I would say, you know, as you're making your decisions, you know, sleep over it, wake up in the morning and go with your gut. But in the year leading up to that, you should have done the work, mm. uh, right? To think about it, talk to the people, you know, learn. And I think it goes back to the idea of unlearning, right? Mm-hmm. Listen, open your mind to ideas, talk to people, talk to people you respect and people who may have made choices that you didn't agree with. Both are important because they will give you a sense of, you know, what their motivations might be. It might teach you what you do not want to know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that aspect of being open and unlearning your ideas of what you think may be right and being open to that internal that input, I think is really the the most powerful technique that women can adopt because I think we are naturally open to that, right? I mean, I think we typically seek information where, you know, uh, uh, most of the women I work with are looking for, you know, uh, trying to learn more and gather more data. So I think those two things would, would really um, be helpful. Um, and then I think the other aspect of it is... Um, you know, being, I go back to the theme of being your own author, right? So there's one part of self-determination and Mm -hmm. knowing what is it that you seek. The other part of it is um, when you you are an author, you write about, right? You speak about what you believe in, what you're passionate about. So I think sharing that excitement about the work you're doing, um, you're talking about it, um, giving people your ideas or share, you know, Providing that, being open to it, I think makes a big difference because that gives you access to leadership if you're, you know, setting up a meeting to tell them about the work you're doing or how excited you are about this opportunity. It also kind of pivots the conversation. So mm-hmm. it kind of makes it a more um, a more of a collaboration approach where somebody is also able to learn from you. Mm-hmm. So I think as, you know, kind of women think about the need to be pragmatic, acknowledge the challenges that they might have, mm-hmm. um, figure out how to really decipher their own message, whatever that message is, and then, you know, use that yeah. message and share that over and over again, yeah. I think would be really important. And and your own career journey is a phenomenal reflection of exactly that, being very clear about your North Star, um, being pragmatic and owning your voice and sharing that message, uh, which really positions you as a, a subject matter expert and an influential thought leader, you know, not just someone who's good at doing their job, but is actually driving change beyond their role and beyond their organization, um, which, you know, a lot of times there's this concern that it might be bragging or self-promotion, and I'm uncomfortable with that. But, you know, how have you seen that where the typical hesitation why someone is afraid to put their point of view out there? What has helped you sort of own that and not be limited by, you know, expressing yourself? That's a really, really good question, right? Because uh, and I'll be honest with you, when somebody asked me to, um, you know, um, write something, be part of a book, my first instinct was, Oh my God, that would seem like, you know, so, um, uh, so immodest or, you know, putting your word out there, right? So I think that naturally comes to us because, you know, we, we operate under the construct that what we have to share is not always valuable. 
right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's something to acknowledge. Um, I think the the other part of it is, um, you know, when you're, and, and I, I say this to my teams because I'm in consulting, you know, we um, sell ideas, we sell solutions. Um, it's really not about selling, it's about helping. Mm-hmm. So I think when you think about the work you're doing, and I, and I truly believe it is, you know, um, if your purpose is to help, it is to make other people, you know, get to a better outcome. I think that makes you more purposeful in what you share. It makes you more authentic in, you know, why you're doing something. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it, it pivots the, um, the locus from, you know, to your, from yourself um, to them, the, the person you're trying to help. So I think it's really important um, to think about the purpose, the why of what you're doing um, mm-hmm. and kind of anchor that to, you know, your your purpose as an individual, right? So mm-hmm. what you're doing in your professional role, how that's going to help people. And when you put those two things together, I think it gives you a real voice, a voice that um, is authentic, not because of just what you're saying, but why you're saying it and why you're speaking up. Um, and I think that that is, that is transformational for yourself and also for you know, any conversation you're in. So mm-hmm. I think that's kind of how I've tried to navigate. Wow. Um, so reframing it from self-promotion to service, because you can't help someone if they don't even know you or what you do or how that's helpful to them. So being able to express that uh, gives you a bigger platform to make a difference. That's right. That's right. You know, and I was heavily influenced early in the years, you know, in my early um, professional years, by the writings of Jim Collins and the servant leader. Mm-hmm. And I truly, truly believe that because, you know, in leadership and we're all leaders, right? No matter what role we are in our families and our communities, we're all leaders. And if you can pivot your purpose to, to be serving, to helping other people and to be enabling, um, I, I think it makes for a very different conversation and outcome. Um, so I think I, I, try, I, I try to do that, you know, and you, you still will have self-doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're saying, hey, you know, I'm doing this because I can help this person, mm-hmm. um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a better outcome. Excellent. So let's pivot a little bit to home life and, um, it, you know, how you've managed uh, an extraordinary career and lots of global responsibilities with, uh, you know, uh, home and being a mom and all of that. And what has worked and perhaps even some challenges that you have faced or continue to face? So, you know, I, I think... Um, for someone who um, didn't really consider myself as, you know, um, I, I, I'm going to go out and say this, you know, as a, a woman in terms of my role, right? Because I think growing up in India, I had a lot of expectations around the role of what a woman is supposed to do. I had role models who did that and did more. Um, so, I, you know, eventually, I think I really started thinking of myself as a person, right? <laughs> not as a which, which I think we all are, but not as a woman, right, in the professional um, life. So I never was conscious of my, well, I'm conscious, but, you know, that was my operating model was as a person with something to contribute, yeah. not as a woman, you know. So that was just my way of navigating and making sense of all these different expectations we are, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when I become became a, a mother and I have a 16-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old, I think it um, – changed that perspective um, quite a bit um, in that, you know, I started seeing that very candidly as my primary identity Mm. Um, because I think part of this is, you know, they say like your children are not your own, right? They're the the gift from the universe to give back. I I did see that that role as as a parent to kind of enable them, right? So I I think for that reason, I I do see my primary identity as, as a mother. And I think to that extent, um, I, I, everything I do in my work um, is also geared towards, you know, this, this larger purpose I have, right? Mm-hmm. So, so keeping all of that, but I know that's, that's a lot, but I'm, you know, I'm just being very candid here. Um, it, it's not been easy because, um, you know, my children had some health issues. Um, as you're traveling and working and consulting, you know, all of these things become um, 
compounding factors, right? The mm-hmm. exponential effect of each of the challenges we face are, you know, are, are pretty significant. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a, you know, a spouse who has a, a pretty intense job too. So we're kind of in a dual career um, household, uh, managing through, you know, all the things that have to be done, whether it's play dates or, you know, doctor's appointments or, uh, you know, um, making sure that somebody needs to have, uh, you know, five golden coins uh, mm-hmm. for a party tomorrow afternoon, right? <laughs> Right, ten o'clock at night. Um, so there are these. So those. I think those challenges are real. They're you know like every other parent has. Um, I think the way I've navigated is um, one is to you know to accept when I needed the help. Um, I've you know asked for a lot of help. I've taken a lot of help. I've been lucky. I've had family and the ability to have you know help um, through that process uh, of, of raising my my kids. Um, and I think the second part of it is you know, really not forgetting the purpose of, you know, even why I work, right? Or it, it is um, linked to that, you know, in a North Star. If you know why you're doing something, I think striking the balance in the moment, because the balance changes every day, right? Mm-hmm. You may have the perfect balance and somebody falls ill, or you may have the perfect balance and, um, um, you know, you have to drive home from Philly to New York every day because you don't want to leave the kids uh, alone at night, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, you do that and I've done that. So I think th- those kinds of aspects of kind of recognizing that the balance changes, mm-hmm. seeking help and seeking why internally, why we do the things we do are really what help you keep all of those um, multiple uh, priorities that you're all juggling um, in yeah. balance one at a time. And and what is given all of that, you know, there's um, always multiple balls up in the air and you have to do the best you can within that because there's no such thing as perfect balance of eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work and eight hours of fun, you know, uh, for um, any high achiever. Um, it's making choices of what's most important at that point in time. Um, how have you prioritized self-care and what is perhaps a um, daily or weekly sort of uh, habit or ritual that has helped you? You know, some days it's that cup of coffee. Some days it's getting a run in in Central Park, right? And yeah. then I've done my self-care. Some days it's maybe working out with my girlfriend. So so I think it, the answer changes a little bit every day. The key is to find that moment that you're able to find gratitude around mm. amidst the, the multiple things that you're trying to prioritize. And the answer is, at least for me, it's it's a different answer every day, but you still have to seek and find it. That is wonderful. Well, um, as we wrap up this interview, I, I want to have you share maybe a final uh, words of advice or a parting, you know, pearl of wisdom with our audience um, as, you know, what is the biggest uh, thing that you want to leave everyone with? So I think it's really, you know, those three things which I have um, spent my time thinking about um, as I've tried to navigate. Mm. I think it's the aspect of, you know, be your own author, be conscious, be intentional about, you know, how you're defining your potential because anybody can do anything if they put their mind and focus to it. So, you know, choose wisely, choose yourself to be the author. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the first thing. I think the second part of it is, you know, reflecting on an ongoing basis because as the pace of the world and work changes, the answer is going to change every day. Mm -hmm. The answer to how you might get self-care will change every day. So reflect daily and, you know, find that answer and it may be a different answer and embrace that. Um, And I think the third part of it is you know really be to own self be true um you know keep, keep that north star of who you are and your purpose um, and why you do the work you do central to everything um, because that that is transformational for yourself it helps you find meaning it helps you give meaning to others um, and i think you know that's probably what i tell my kids too so Well, thank you. This has been uh, incredible. Appreciate you sharing not only your stories, but also the strategies that have worked uh, for you and providing the context about the future of work and all the impending challenges and how in that context of disruptive and rapid change, it's even more important for us to go inward and be truthful with ourselves and be reflective and discover our own voice and author our own story. So thank you so much for being on the 
the show and we're, uh, we wish you all the very best for the future and uh, look forward to uh, having our audience learn from this. Thank you so much, Nikki. This is wonderful and I am really grateful for the opportunity. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com where you'll find show notes, links, and the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.